Right, I was born in a tennis called Quarrydeen, which is on Station Road just before you arrive at the top of Strike Lane. Uh, and that and Providence Row, which is the stone terrace at the top of Strike Lane, were owned by the Hinchcliffs, who owned the quarry and the houses really backed on uh, to the quarry. Um, Four of, sorry, three out of my four grandparents had all been born in Skelmanthorpe, so you can say that my roots were fairly true linear. Plenty of relatives spread all over the village. The disadvantage of that was if you ever got into mischief, your parents knew about it before you got home. Uh, my maternal grandfather was a fisher, and uh, John Stevenson, his great-great-grandfather was the same as my great-great-grandfather. Some of you might have known Ian Bauer and Bobby Greaves. They too had the same great-grandfather. My me, uh, grand Ma Fisher was a Dyson, and there were loads of Dyson spread over the village. Some you might know, one you'll even know, Frank. Ian Dyson had the same great-grandfather. Neil Dyson. Uh, Roy Sharp and his brother who was a decorator, uh, Betty Sharp and Valerie Sharp, um, they were all from the same Dyson stock. On my father's side, my grandmother was an Eastwood, and I only know of two of her brothers, but there were others who I don't know about. Jack and Malcolm Eastwood, they're a generation after me as it were, because it was their great-great-grandfather Eastwood, who was the same as my great-grandfather Eastwood. Uh, the comer in was my grandfather senior, uh, and he'd been born at Magnum, uh, a hamlet that's now disappeared above Aid Edge, where the quarries were, which are really above Windscar Reservoir. And it was a quarrying village. Uh, it really should have been called John Dalton, because he was born before his father, Humphrey Dalton, who was only 17 at the time, was married to his, uh, his mother, Sally Senior. Uh, and they came to live in Skelmanthorpe, I think roughly at the time that the railway was being built. So the skills that were used in the quarry were obviously going to be used in the building of the, the railway. So, one of the things you know, when I learned that a certain John Dalton was supposed to be the father of atomic theory, that set me on a scientific path. <laughs> because I should have been a John Dalton. All right, well, the, something about now the house in which I lived. Mid-terrace house, and if you went in at the back door, facing you was a door that went down into the cellar. In the cellar was what we call the stone, Big stone slab set on two stone pillars, probably come straight out of the quarry when the Inchlets built the houses. Kept a very stable temperature, not only between day and night, but over the seasons. So very good for keeping milk, butter, meat and things like that uh, at a, a reasonably good temperature. Alongside that door was a door into what we call the front room. Immediately on the left hand side was a window and then next to that was a shallow stone sink which had just a cold running water tap into it. On the party wall with next door was the kitchen range. Fire in the centre. On the right hand side was a boiler which you got into by lifting the lid. Got hot water out with a ladling can or what we call the piggy and you put Cold water and placed it in there at the same time. On the left hand side was a nice black leaded oven with stainless steel hinges and uh, handle, door handle. Uh, the boiler was on all the time, you had a fire lit, the oven not so. You prevented the hot coals from the fire going underneath the oven by, you, by what was called an end iron. Had a little only at the top, you could pull it out, pull it out, the coals from the fire went underneath the oven, 
pulled the damper out above the oven, which opened a route for the draft to go back into the chimney and you get all the heat going around the oven. The damper was a kind of um, thermostat and, you know, when you used it, my mother became fairly skilled at adjusting it to get the oven to the right kind of temperature. Uh, no electricity in the house. Um, we had gas. Um, to get gas to give out any reasonable light, you need what's called a gas mantle, which were very fragile, periodically burnt out and had to be replaced. In the front room, uh, we had a piano, sideboard, settee, two easy chairs, and the fireplace there was quite a pleasant one. It had a set of quite decorative tiles which went round it. It wasn't one of the more modern 1950s style fireplaces, it was, uh, I suppose, a late Victorian fireplace. The door from that in the corner opened up to where the front door came in, and the stairs went up <coughs> to two bedrooms and another flight of stairs into the attic. We had lived in the house when I was born, although I never knew my grandma, but my grandfather and grandma Fisher lived with us. There was my mother and father, and I had two older sisters living there. Fairly cramped, not as cramped as some of the houses though, um, which had even bigger families. Um, across at the back of the yard, there were a set of four earth closets for the four houses in the terrace. And that once a month, the council would come round with a lorry, and some unfortunate council employee had to go in. There was a big door in the kind of side facing the houses, the earth closets faced the other way, uh, to come dig the stuff out, put it in the lorry, which was taken and dumped now where the football fields are. So underneath there, in addition to all the other types of rubbish, a lot of human excrement. Also each of the houses had a wash kitchen which had in a, a set pot and of course we had the usual mangle, uh, wash tub and whatever. Uh, so that was uh, the house I lived in. My father would get up on a Sunday morning and he'd always light the fire on a Sunday morning and get the oven going. Uh, and that was the morning we had a egg and bacon for breakfast and during the right time of year he'd wake me up and we'd go down Strike Lane and a couple of fields before you reach the, uh, the railway bridge they usually have a good crop of mushrooms and there's nothing tastes like field mushrooms fried in bacon fat uh, with an egg to follow. Uh, we only pick, my father would only pick field mushrooms and horse mushrooms. I'm a bit more adventurous because someone's taught me a bit more. I'm also willing to gather bluets and parasol mushrooms and uh, St. George's mushrooms. Uh, they look very much like field mushrooms but they fruit at about the time of St. George's Day. That's why they have that name. And the last time I got anyone was out, any of them was out of the old wreck down Pilling Lake. There's some used to grow there, I don't know. I find it more difficult to find mushrooms these days. I don't think they're quite as prolific as they were in the past. Um, school I attended was St Aidan's. My father was an Anglican, my mother a primitive Methodist. So the bargain was we'd go to St Aidan's day school and we'd go to Pilling Lane Sunday school. So I got a double dose of religion at the church school and at the Sunday school. Uh, when I first went to St Aidan's, it was an all age school, that is, right up to the age of 14. There were five teachers. Miss Morehouse took the reception, what we call the reception class uh, these days. The other teachers, Miss Haig, Miss Dianley, Miss Brownhill, and Mr. Lackin. Once some thought modern school opened, Miss Dearnley and Miss Brownhill left 
and we were just left with three classes, there'd probably be two or two and a half years in each class. My memories of uh, being in Miss Morehouse's class, one of them was they had some camp beds, aluminium X frame like that, canvas slung in between them, and after lunch we had to go to bed. There was also a rocking horse in it. If you were good, you occasionally got the privilege of riding on it. Uh, we sat at forms, small wooden chairs, a form in front. And the one thing I remember about the form that was the card in front of each individual was a set of squares, 12 by 12. So there was a gross of little squares in one big square. And it helped in all sorts of little mathematical things um, that we did. Learning to read, well, I seem to remember she wrote at on the blackboard, and then went down the alphabet, you know, putting in as many letters that fitted, like bat, cat, and so on. So, you know, we, we learned, and it stuck. Um, so that was really the infants. Um, once you left the infants, the boys then went into the boys' playground, as Margaret will remember, whilst we were in the infants, we were privileged to join the girls in their playground. Um, you did the usual things, you know, leading up to Christmas, we made little raffia mats to put teapots on and things like that. The traditional thing at Christmas was to make a calendar. The headmaster provided a little tab with all the dates in and we had to take cardboard and bits of old wallpaper to cover it with and a picture cut out of a magazine or something. Um, we did that. Um, always remember one thing. Once when Mr. Lapkin was out, we noticed that behind his desk was a timetable and it was a revelation to us because every week we were supposed to have games. We got them about, maybe we were lucky, once a month. And I always remember one um, game, we were playing cricket, and the pitch was just a bit above the school, next to where the fire station is now. And um, most of us were right-handed, so if we slogged, it went up to where the new vicarage is, and if we were batting at the top end, it went into the area where the new fire station is, no problem. But one of your relations, Dennis, was a left-hander, right. Raymond. Oh, I remember. All right. And he got a ball, he slogged it, there was a tinkle of glass. <laughs> we never had any games after that. Uh, Mr. Larkin, if you could do maths, you were all right with him. But it'd be after your time, Margaret. There was an evacuee who was hopeless at maths. And we always started the day off with mental arithmetic. And more often than not, he wouldn't get a score. And this infuriated Mr. Larkin. And I read two or three times a week he would be caned. I mean, Terrible, uh, but that was, you know, the kind of discipline that was administered in those days. Um, games we played in the yard. We had one. I don't know whether you had a similar game down at what well, called the board school, but um, one it was called Krusty Bump. Any of you know of Krusty Bump? Well, I tell you what it was. Wouldn't be allowed these days. You divide it into two teams, and one team allows to go with his, to the wall, and the rest of the team, a bit like Leapfrog, formed a long column, heads and reveal the thing. And the aim was for the other team to come and jump onto the backs of these, and if the whole team could get on without their feet touching the floor or falling off, it continued until that, and then you swapped over. Um, so that was one thing we played. We played marbles, and there were two games, I don't know whether anyone knows 
the one, can't quite remember the rules, but it was called net. And instead of having a fairly shallow hole to send the marbles into, you dug a hole with about a circumference about that and a deep one. And the aim was, with your marbles in the hand, to pitch as many of them as you could into the hole. And the per I think the person who managed to get most in scooped all the ones that were in the hole. One other thing we did was it was all time we built what was called the Burma Road. I don't know what our parents thought about our handkerchiefs, but the, the, I mean the, the, the boys' schoolyard was full of stones and in dry weather a lot of dust. So we gathered these stones and we built them all the way around the edge of the yard and then we had dust in our handkerchiefs and we went and dumped it up with the stones, as I say. I don't know what our parents thought about our handkerchiefs. Nicknames. Most of us had nicknames. Uh, mine started off as synagogue, mainly because I like to answer questions at the uh, uh, if the preacher was asking questions at the chapel I'd be more than willing to answer them and I think I've said synagogue once too often and one of my mates that was my nickname because he went to St. David's as well but some of them certainly wouldn't be allowed today you know they point ten little blank boys don't you well, one of them was called that blank. Uh, partly because of his colour of his hair and partly because of his name, Blackburn. Uh, rather more unfortunate, although, as far as I'm aware, he took it in good part and there was absolutely no malice on the people who used the nickname. But your brother had a speech impediment and he had the nickname TikTok. Uh, as I say, took it in good part, never any malice, and you know, as far as we know, we didn't take any offence. Other names, Planky, that's from his name, some of you might know what I'm talking about, he's not very well at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, Plugus, uh, Rambugi, Rommel, that, that was Raymond, I think it was because, oh. because the, the way his fair hair was a bit like a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit like uh, that. My name progressed through a whole range of things. Um, when I left uh, St. David's and went to Harmony, it became Seth. The later on it became Seth, and that was from Seth Senior's Fine Ale, because the local pubs were owned by Seth Seniors, and there was a lot in the district, and so I ended up at only as Seth. I did get another one when I first started teaching. Uh, it was in Harrogate and there was a fair number of the staff that, like me, had just left Cambridge. And there was a habit of tacking errs onto the end of everything. So David Lockwood became known as Lockers, Peter Gedling, Gedders. John Clapham, Clappers. John Picard, Pickers. But Senior, didn't really lend itself. And one day I, I went with David Lockwood, he ran the under 15 rugby team, and I went with him to Ermistead's Grammar School in Skipton with the rugby team. And it had been pouring down all morning and the pitch was all muddy. And I happened to say, oh, it's a bit claggy here. And so I got christened claggers. <laughs> um, they'd never heard the term the southerners but I think most of you will know what I mean uh, by claggy. Um, childhood, there were sad times sometimes because two of my friends died quite young. Donald Hartill, the eldest of the Hartill children, he died. He had his tonsils out, came home, got diphtheria. Wouldn't happen today, of course, if he'd got diphtheria. He would be easily cured, but he died at about the age of nine or ten. John Taylor uh, had childhood leukemia and died, I think, about the age of twelve. And so 
you know, a number of these things wouldn't happen today. Um, going back to Le uh, Station Road, when I was about seven, 1942, we moved to Wood Street. At that time during the war, if a house became vacant, very often it was commandeered for an evacuee family. Now, my father and his mother own three houses on Wood Street. The, the houses that back immediately onto Wood Street, just after you turn around the right angle corner at the top end there. And the end one, the biggest of the three, the tenant left. Now, neither my father nor my grandma wanted to don't be taken over by evacuees. Mind you, there were, there, there were some good families of fact, evacuees, there were some who were allowed property to go to rack and ruin. And so we did a, a, what you might call a midnight flip. Christine's father came with his lorry, and my uncle James and my father loaded stuff up, heavy piano and all that, and we moved in overnight. The laughable part was, neither did Inchless want that house taken up, so someone else moved in <laughs> the next day. So uh, the house we moved into, it had electricity, no gas, no running water, still an earth closet, no bathroom, still the same old tin bath in front of the fire on a Friday night. Uh, things we used to do, which I don't think take place much, we used to go, I suppose some people might call it, uh, um, well we used to call it Rady. I'm only going to mention my name, I'm not going to tell you my compasses, but raiding was uh, going to an, an orchard and relieving the owner of a few apples. Um, I don't know whether you know Fairmount Farm up on the field road, yeah, yeah. over on the left. Well, they had a, a line of about 10 apple trees, all going in a straight line towards the railway line. So, about half a dozen of us, summer holidays, not much to do with, assembling the fields next to Stead Gate, the Stead Gate footpath. And, best tradition, hands and knees, crawl along the edge bottom, over the wall and on, and sample the apples. And all we ended up was <laughs> with uh, rather painful stomachs afterwards. So that was raining. Other things that we did. We, um, it seems to have died out completely, but was letting the Christmas in and letting the New Year in. Mm -hmm. Used to go around on Christmas morning, come to let the Christmas in, please will you let me in. Mostly it was your uncles and aunts who were invited you to go so on, you, you get a shilling maybe or even half a crown. But for other houses we call that, if you were the first one you might get a sixpence. If you were a subsequent one, you might get a penny, and later on they'd you know, say, well, we've had someone. Um, so that was Christmas and the New Year. We used to go um, carol singing. Um, and again, that was quite a lucrative occupation. Two or three of us would get together and we'd go around in, um, you know, fortnight before Christmas, sing, use our angelic voices to uh, get, you know, a six months or so. Uh, holidays. Well, the first, in fact, the first holiday I ever had is my first recollection of all. My father had been in the Navy at the end of the First World War and continued as a regular in the Navy for some time afterwards. And he was in the Royal Naval Reserve right up till he was 40 in 1938. Fortunately, he could then cease to be, he was invited when war broke out to rejoin the Navy as petty officer, but he turned it down and went into a, a directed occupation. He was either going and working in a munitions factory in Huddersfield or going and working with the outcrop. I mean, that was always an outdoor type, so he volunteered to go to the outcrop. But connection with the Navy, every year, during the factory, he worked at Field and Bottles. During their holiday week, he had to go down to Plymouth for training. 
And so 1938, the first year he didn't have to, he still wanted to go back down there, so he took us all on holiday to Dawlish. And that's my earliest recollection, sitting in the boarding house, looking out towards the sea, and between the house and the sea, there was the railway line. And trains seemed, as far as I remember, come out of the tunnel at one end and go across and into a tunnel at the other. From my earliest recollection. The other holiday I had was the following year at Heathorpe, but then war came, no more holidays, and after the war, didn't go on holidays, but the chapels and the local clubs ran excursions, and I have memories of about a dozen buses supplied by Yorkshire Traction, engaged by the Buff Club to take the children and families of their members to whichever seaside resort there was. Um, Sunday schools used to run trips to the coast. I remember going down religiously every Friday night, paying sixpence into a fund to kind of defray the costs when we eventually went. Um, a lot of the social life revolved around clubs or the chapels. I mean, most people went to Sunday school when they were our age. There were a fair number in the village. There was one in the, what we call the Wesleyans, the Central Methodist, which is now beside the pot there and is in apartments. Pilling Lane, the Wesleyan Reform down in Blaine, Sunday school. The church had one, Saddle Road, we call it the Mission, but Saddle Road Hall also had a Sunday school. The social life for children tended to revolve around those things. One thing that I really enjoyed going to Pinning Lane was something they called the Friday Fellowship. And the good thing about it was there was a mixture of ages there. You could go when you were about 11. But there were quite a number of older people there. And as children we played table tennis and all sorts of things. And there'd always be a supper at the end of it, and then people would tell tales. I always remember Edwin Dyson, who some of you might know, recounting the time when he was courting. He came from Clayton West and he was courting a girl um, from, uh, I think it was Ruth Law, from Scunthorpe. And he said, You know, I was going a bit bald, so I thought I'd better do something about it. So, I knew George Tinker sold hair restorer. Um, half a crown a bottle. Most things in those days. I mean, he, he did an, a good influenza mixture, half a crown a bottle. <laughs> he said, and I used to go, I used to get one every month. And he said, I've been going about nine months. When I looked at him, and he was as bold as a coat. <laughs> so I stopped going um, thereafter. One other thing I remember from the Sunday school was the Easter, Sunday, Easter Monday hike. We'd, uh, again you have to be about 11 to go on it, and we'd catch the 8 o'clock train from Scunthorpe, get off at Brocco's, and then walk, just missing home first, up to what was called the Isle of Skye pub on the A635 over to, uh, to Lancashire there. And when we got there, we'd have some sandwiches with us, we'd probably buy a drink at the pub, uh, you know, non-alcoholic drink at the pub. We'd eat them there. Uh, the pub disappeared when they built Scamden Dam for fear of pollution. And then we set off down the West Indian Valley series of reservoirs and on a good day they were beautiful. Some Easter Mondays I remember the snow would still be that high up alongside the roads and the track down Wizenden uh, Valley and we'd walk all the way down to Marsden and there we'd catch the bus into town and catch I think it was the 415 train from Huddersfield arriving back at Scunthorpe just before five. So that was another thoroughly enjoyable um, thing.
thing. So it's not really bring me to the end of what I wanted to say. If any of you have any questions, I'm willing to answer. Well, I think we might be related enough to have said that. Because, um, uh, my stepfather's father and his parents lived at Magnum. I did they? Yeah. And you're the first person I've ever met at Dales from there, which yeah. I was really. Well, apparently, my great grandfather kept an ale, even though he was quite young in ale house. But ale in those days was somewhat different. You know, it was a very weak. I'm fairly sure my grandfather had known him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was called Humphrey Dalton. Uh, uh, well, there weren't that many houses at Magnum. No, you can still see the foundation oh, yeah. we to look, yeah. of the houses, yeah. I don't think there have been more than half a dozen. No, that's right. This, I don't know whether it was part of the hamlet, but there is still one built, occupied building just as you cross the road before you get to it. Yeah. Uh, but then I think they were probably pulled down in, what, in the 50s, were they? I can't remember them being in the houses there. Mind you, not having a car, we never... I, it was only later in life that I, uh, I went there and saw it. Yeah. Well, I'll be a picture of them on the magnet, I don't know. Oh, yeah. 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 And you know, you talked about late like, Christmas in. Yeah. Didn't you used to give a piece of coal? We didn't know, but I, mean, I know that was... <coughs> the tradition in some places for the new year to, to give the people go. You have to have a certain colour of hair. And dark they used to like people, people who've got dark hair yeah. to go and do it. You'd have to be going to George Tinker these days. Yes. <laughs> oh, very nice, right? <laughs> oh. I said worse to her. So oh. I'm, not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Did people tend to go to George Tinker's instead of doctors then, things? You know, oh yeah, I mean, if you've got a kind of flowy thing, you'd go to George Tinker and, right. and, and get a bottle of his influenza mixture. Well, I mean, today they try and encourage you to go and see the pharmacist yeah. rather than going to the doctors. It would cost you to go to the doctors, wouldn't it? Prior to 40 Pardon? It would have cost you anyway to go to the doctors. Yes, you know, to yes, yes uh, yeah, Dr. Bell. In his little red Triumph two seater. So where was the doctor's? Uh, in the Quad Car Park. Oh, no. And before that, I think there was probably a doctor. The doctors were the opposite side of the road because that row oh, goes down the face. It's known as Doctor Row. But um, which is where Eddie uh, Dyson That's right. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, Doctor Douglas Bell followed his father in that his son became a doctor but not a GP in, in Scunthorpe. I think it was Dr. Wiley who followed Dr. Bell. Pardon? It's Dr. Bell to save, he saved my life, so they say. It reminds me when you were talking about during the war and the, and the sort of um, people who came from, from London mm -hmm. because we had a um, sort of a, um, a mum, I remember, uh, I'd be about, because um, I was seven when the war started, and I uh, would be about eight, I think, and we had this um, this sort of, um, because I know our, well, it was a, the house next door to, um, to Ruth, where I was born, and we had three bedrooms, and I know I was an only child, and I had a bedroom at the back, <coughs> and I know I had to come out of my bedroom into my mum's bedroom my dad's bedroom and then a, a, a lady, a mum and her daughter, a two year old daughter, lived with us for nearly almost a year <coughs> and then they got a house after they lived they, um, they got a house then up um, Gid Lane but after that then, do you remember uh, some of you might remember the Phoenix yes, my sister uh, the company from London who came they were um, they sort of did something with the um, pilots. The electrical wiring. Yes, yes. And they were sort of, they came um, 
for security and everything, and they took over part of Fields Mill. And we had a, a, one of the, uh, the ladies who came, there were quite a few ladies, and she was in, in charge of the, the, a lot of the girls who came. I think there would be about 20 girls who came. And they, had, they sort of lodged with various people in the village. And we had this lady um, called Lil, and she lived in our house with mum and dad um, and five or six years. And, and, and then she went back to London and we were, we were friends for forever until she died. And uh, my auntie, uh, Auntie Ellen, who used yeah. to have the sweet, sweet shop, shop yes. um, where the dentist is now. Yes. And um, so she, she'd never been married and she got very friendly with this lady. And uh, for some reason, I think, she didn't, she didn't own the shop, but she rented it and I think the people who bought it uh, sort of um, wanted to do something else with it. I, I forget her name, but I think she had a dress shop. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Auntie happened a job and I know Lil was going back to London and she did a very good job and she just said, will you come down um, and be housekeeper for me? Because she was on her own and because her parents had died. And she said, um, and I know my auntie uh, said, she said, well, I don't know. And she discussed it with my mum and everything. And she said, look, I'll go for two weeks <laughs> and see how <laughs> And she never came back, did she? And she never came home. Oh. She settled down there and she, she joined in with all the um, sort of um, the social side of living in London and everything. Yes. yes. Just reminded me, John, yes. that you said that. Yes. Talking about evacuees. I made friends with one, he was called Brian Ekes, and they lived in the house, you know where the new roundabout is down Station Road? Mm -hmm. Immediately on the right hand side there's a, there's a house, bottom, you know, opposite Boggard Lane, mm -hmm. and coming down there, and they lived there, and I got invited to the house once or twice, but he called his mother Meta, and his father Peter. Peter. So I got an introduction to Latin quite <laughs> early on. Was it actually built for a pub, John, for railway? It might have been, I, I don't know that. So that's all I said, if you look at it, it is built. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. tell you it was built. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure it ever made. It before, no. But the gentleman built on the building railway. Where, 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 where Pickersfield used to live. Where, Pardon? Where, where Pickersfield used to live, that one. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's a house that stands opposite the red brick houses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking of that one. You're talking about cows here, John. Uh, I remember me and Stephen House uh, used to go cows here. And we were Westfield Avenue. And you, you mentioned Mission. And there were a couple of lives um, just, just a bit further up from where you were then this other side. House up going there. On Westfield Avenue on Westfield Drive. And there was something to do with mission, I can't remember what they called them. Not clay, was it? No. No, no, what, no. Any road. We we knocked shot Dover and we've been singing, you know, We Three Kings and <laughs> oh, you know. And uh, halfway through was rendition. They opened the door and invited us in to sing. Well, we never had that happen before, so you know. <laughs> Invited us into, we stood there in the kitchen, wondering what to do. <laughs> and uh, so we had to turn, the only way we could manage it, we turned and faced the door and, and managed to squeeze out a few uh, <laughs> while Shepherd dressed. And then they give us, uh, well, they didn't give us any money, they give us some sweets, so we thought, well, we're not going there. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned names of roads. There are some that are, the names of, gone out of existence, for instance, West End. Yes. Um, West End is which is yeah. yes. lane, but we call it West End. Yeah. Cumworth Road, we always call, I always call Cumworth Common. Yeah. Yes. Huddersfield yeah. Road, sure. Shelley Common. Yeah. Uh, the bottom end of Wood Street, Quarry Hill. Yeah. Uh, Greenside, the Green Lane, mm. the, the, the Savile Road and yeah. King Street. And um, the, the other one that seems to be going out, Little Hill, that, you know where Brenda Ellens was, mm -hmm. the little yeah. steep mm -hmm. the slope that goes down to the hill, that was always known as Little Hill. Sure, no, I didn't.
life changed for you once you've gone to the grammar school? Pardon? How did life change for you once you went to the grammar school? Well, one, one of the things that I did every Tuesday night for about three years before I left Scumhub was to go out with a chap on a Tuesday night, friend Radley. Distant relation to Christine's, but he was a man of all trades. He worked at the pit head at Scumhub during the day. He had a barber's shop the top of Little, yes. uh, Little Hill, which he opened Monday, not Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, evenings, Saturday mornings and afternoons. And on uh, Tuesday evening, he, uh, he went round selling firewood. Pick, broken pick props, there was a sawmill, down the pit head in Scunthorpe, the, um, what did we call it? Oh, never mind. Um, and the, they would be cut into that kind of length, which we bagged, helped him bag. Me and Richard Blackburn would help him bag, you know, whilst he was off sometimes with his um, with the horse and cart, we'd be bagging the logs ready for when he came back. Um, and uh, that I did, you know, got given sixpence at the end of the evening. Uh, but I had one or two amusing incidents. For one thing, one half term, I remember taking his old horse to, Denby, to the smithy at Denbydale, walking it uh, to be shoed. I'd only be about nine at the time, uh, you know. He got the old horse became slower and slower, so he decided to get a new one. And it was a bit frisky. And sometimes we'd spend more time, because it did nothing during the week on the run around the field, sometimes we'd spend more time catching the horse <laughs> to get it under the car and go around with the wood. And one place we always used to finish up on the, uh, at the end of Tuesday evening was where you live, Stephanie. All right. Charlie Radley's. Mm. I, think, I don't know his fr friend Radley's brother oh, or was not. We always finished up uh, there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all those things went when I went to uh, grammar school. I uh, Homework had to be done. Uh, I always remember uh, I managed to scrape into two way, I think. And the first month, they had monthly marks at school. Um, we had to bring on the homework diary with the month, you know, with a, the position in the form at the end of each month as a result of tests in every subject. And the first month, I was 10th. And uh, my sister, who was at training college at the time, said, well, that's not bad for two weeks. Next month, I was down to 17th. I got a roasting. <laughs> Things improved after that. <laughs> I got one as well after, you know, two or three years after when I went to Hungary and I went over. We had to have these sheets signed, I don't know whether you just live it. And I was well down, I think, the second one of, you know, one of the months. And I didn't dare ask me that to sign it until I was going back up more. So, <laughs> but I knew I should get a relic I got old. <laughs> And he says, that John Senior doesn't mess about. <laughs> Little deal, <though. laughs> yeah. One other thing that changed, Frank, was if I'd done the homework and done the gar gardening, because we had quite a large garden, we'd grow vegetables which we, people had orders for, and I'd, in my job to pick the peas, and take them out on a Friday night to those people who ordered them. Pick Brussels sprouts in winter and take those out. But if I'd done my homework and my gardening, I was allowed to go up to the cricket club. And I, I, I played one or two matches for Scunthorpe second team. And then the headmaster at home, Mr. Brain, decided, he discovered that some boys were playing football for school on a Saturday morning and then going away and playing for their local team 
on a Saturday afternoon, which he thought was not good. Uh, couldn't be giving of their best for either the school or the club. So he forbade us to play for a local club. So we had to make up our minds whether we were going to play for school. So I, I opted to play for school. And uh, I, uh, I uh, you know, had to give up at uh, playing Scunthorpe second team. Uh, but I enjoyed, I mean, I captained the second football team occasionally. When they were short of a, a right back, I played for the first team. I always remember Mr. Wellsby, the sportsmaster, in the school magazine used to write a report about each player. He said of me, Senior broke up attack after attack only to give the ball back to the opposition. <laughs> I was rather more successful at, at cricket. I played consistent for the first team for three years. Uh, so I enjoyed it. Yeah, so, you know, a number of activities. You remember Mr. Brain? Yes. Well, <laughs> I do remember Mr. Brain. I mean, Mr. Brain, oh, I mean, I, I, the people today remember Mr. Mr. Brain once said when we were in the sixth form, um, he said to us, he said, um, we've been very fortunate, the girls, because we'd had to um, um, sort of um, be um, brought up in school with, alongside the boys and uh, it had done us all good because we'd have the boys to more or less not say look up to, but you know, <laughs> and, uh, but, the, yeah, but on the other hand, the boys were they'd be brought up a bit soft because they'd have girls with them. <laughs> <laughs> In no compunction about wanging the board over that, you know. Mm. What, one, one thing he did that I learned later from Mr. Mallinson was that he insisted that the male members of staff wore a hat to go to school so they could raise them such power, to the ladies. Oh, he did. Oh, he, yeah, I mean, some, some very good staff left because of that. Yeah, I, know, like a I know Mr. Barron, yeah, yeah. who was a maths master, and uh, he, well, he should have taught us in the sixth form, but after the first term, he left and went to Huddersfield College those days, as it was called. And we were left without a maths teacher for two two terms. <laughs> All we had was a textbook we worked through. He occasionally breathed in. He was a mathematician and a physicist. He'd breathe in, you know, how are we going on? So for two terms we virtually taught ourselves. He uh, couldn't teach for toffee, man. Well, I don't have... <laughs> Well, it depends who he was teaching. Well, I know anybody who would have Established this school, and I think he probably, you know, wanted. He was the first head. Yes, 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 yes. And he, he, he really, really drilled it into you is that if you worked, all things were possible. For you. Whatever back, whatever your background was, uh, you know, you 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 could achieve anything. And. Uh, well, when I got to all I mean, it retired at the uh, yeah. and Ronnie Mullen was there. But they all held him in great reverence. Uh, that, you know, so I must have realised he's, you know, what, what a good chap he was. Yeah. I mean, they it talked very, about him really fondly. He yeah. was very caring. You know, if there were anybody in trouble, he'd be there. And he always went, you know, people sick and that he sort of thing. He persuaded my parents to like go into the sixth form. I mean, normally we weren't very well off. I'd have left at sixteen, and yeah. there was a chance to miss the fifth form and go into the sixth form. And he persuaded my parents to let me do that. And uh, you know, that's. Uh, if you went to Oxford, then you must have had your name engraved in, yes, in it, reception. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You only yeah. got your name engraved there if you went to Oxford, didn't you? Is it no. Still there. Yeah. Is the board still there? Uh, no, Oxford, 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 Ox
no, 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 no. Why so? I mean, the motto was Fortiter in excelsis, strive for the highest. <laughs> and he really. Can you remember the school song? Yeah. Yes. Try for the highest, try for the highest. I've still got some school magazines at home that will dig them out and bring them. Oh, you would still have it. Talk about the towers. Is the board still there? Well, the the is the board still there with the names on at Honley yeah, High School now? I haven't been for a long time, but oh. it was. Well, yeah. well last, uh, last time I went was when uh, Ronnie retired. Mm -hmm. It was still there. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, I think, let's see. Wow, well, it's how many years? This time it's 70 years. I think when we'd been left 50 years, someone organised a, a reunion of our year. And we started off in the school hall, sang, <laughs> no, not the school song, we sang a hymn as we used to do, and then we went off to have a meal somewhere, but and it, they were still there then, so that was 20 years ago. I, I mean, I mean, he'd obviously done something, because my first physics tutor, when I got to Cambridge, only lived a hundred yards away from Scanlon thought. Right. He was a product of brain. Right. Uh, Lewis Merkinshaw. Right. And funnily enough, his uncle was married to my auntie. <laughs> <laughs> so I was surprised to see you, wasn't it? Well, you knew I was going. Yeah. Thank you, well, that's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. And I think we'll do it again, that will you. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Dennis has done his. Dennis has done his. You've done yours. In my lot. Your childhood. 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 Alright, oh, so. You've done it. You've talked about the park here. Well, I've talked about the park here, yeah. Yeah. I've talked about the Southern Law. Fifty-four, eight, fifty-one. Forty-nine, fifty. Don't laugh. Strangely, well, I actually, I, I have a book here. But Uncle Lord gave me some old photographs. I'm going to look through, and I'm going to find out how to put them on a disc, and I'll bring them, and we'll do it on, on, on screen. When I find, when I get one of my. So clearly, I'll have to know all about computers and more not to do. But yeah, there's a, quite a few old photographs, and I'll try and make a story up about them all for next year. That's all right, you know? yeah. Talking of your uncle, no, I, I remember. Is it your uncle? No. So no, no, I thought you, you were talking about, were you? Neil, yeah. Oh, no, no, I thought you were talking about no, no, no. thought. Oh, I mean, not uncle, no, no, it's your uncle. Mm. I. I always remember when I was going to play cricket on a Saturday afternoon, I'd be going down for the one o'clock train, and Raymond's mother and father would always be walking up to catch the bus to go and watch, to go and see their son who was suffering from shell shock. They never failed did they, to go and see him. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Where were they going? Stoll's off? Stoll's off, he, he was in the Navy, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think they were on the Russian convoys. Mm. He got shelled, he got sunk, but he did my man scap in. I never got up to know what I was about it, because he didn't talk about it. But that's the idea. Yeah, I did. Then up to the wall, they've got his, got his name on to... to oh, that's to right, yes. Mm -hmm. Because they were, they were say, he wasn't actually killed in the war, but he might as well say he was, mm -hmm. because he'd been there to be like his stars or us. Which wasn't very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all over then. I'll, I'll get these pictures and I'll, I'll work some down for next year for one day. Yeah, we'll say, look on me, it's a bit boring. Never, never. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.